bet three, two, one. My ducks, my swans, welcome to the pond. My name is Dorian, your host at 82 Points of View with Dorian. Today we got a very special guest. Uh, for those of y'all that know me, I used to be a college basketball coach. I was born in 84, so I was the whole mid 80s. I was really young, but we were living in Japan. When I lived over there, there wasn't no YouTube and all that. So my dad had to wait on the highlights at night. And at, on the highlights at night, we always saw Mike Tyson and whoever Jordan was playing. And at the time, it was Jordan and it was in those pictures. <laughs> Once I got older and I was a 90s kid, I really developed my whole basketball acumen, studying basketball cards. I was a basketball fanatic. And I ended up coaching. And through all that, man, this person who we have on the podcast today, like when I was younger, I hated him. And then once he got to the Bulls, <laughs> I was like, all right, I'll rock with him. He on the Bulls. Then he got to Lakers, like, yo, I, I got to like him. You know what I'm saying? And all the <laughs> stuff he started doing in Hollywood, everything after that. So it's a pleasure today. We have Mr. John Sally. How are you? What's up, D? How are you, brother? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. Appreciate you coming on here. Definitely, man. I, I couldn't wait to get on. <laughs> cool. So the first question we ask everybody is, what's the worst job that you've ever had? worst job i really haven't had a lot of jobs so uh i think the worst thing i did is i shoveled snow and uh this guy told me and my cousin russell that he was going to pay us 20. we shoveled the snow he gave us a dollar piece and told us to get out of the neighborhood how old were you uh we were 13 14 years old he just finessed y'all, huh? Yeah, yeah, he was like, get out of the neighborhood, right? And I said, okay. We waited that night. And we went back in and we turned this water on. So it would, and then we blocked off the, uh, <laughs> we blocked off the, the vent. And we sprayed all up and down the driveway because it was a slanted driveway. Yeah. And we got it really wet and it froze that night. And so when he got up, he had ice to break. Yep, exactly. It cost him more than 20. Yeah. <laughs> Hell no. Where, so, so where are you from originally? Brook, Brooklyn, New York. Okay, okay. Brooklyn, so. New York. Canarsie. Okay. All the way all the way by the water. Bet, bet. So what's your first childhood memory growing up there? Like your very first thing that you remember? Because all y'all from New York got, got something different. Yo, uh, it's funny you say it. it was, I was four years old. It was the biggest snowstorm in New York history, 1968. And I got caught outside uh, in the park facing the building. And my brother was like, you can make it. And it was looking like I was never going to make it. And uh, I remember putting my head down and trying to run in the snow. And I was just running, running, running. And then when I opened my eyes, I was at my building. <laughs> so I guess that was my first, uh, my, my first push to knowing I can do anything. Is your is your brother older? Oh yeah, I'm the youngest of four. Yeah, okay. I'm little Sally. Okay, so is it like so? Is it sisters, brother? Like what's the what's the makeup? Uh, it's, it's it's Will, who's 22 years older than me. My brother Ron is 12 years older than me. My brother Jerry's five years older than me. Then I have two other brothers that I don't really know, and then it's me. So I got to watch all their mistakes, all their accomplishments, and then figure out how to navigate to this point. So were they beating your ass or were they mentoring you? Was it more like father, son, or was it like brother, brother, I'm whooping his his, his little ass? Uh, I don't really get beat. Uh, <laughs> they, they, <laughs> they fought me when I needed to, but not really. I had to make sure. You I got to make sure my background is right. I can't have Michael Jordan in the background and gotcha. not me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that just happened. You know, I, I had my own postcard just to, you know, Peter, get a veggie. <laughs> thought I'd throw that in there. You know what I'm saying? Um, uh yeah my brothers they they were tough but they if if i can like they said if i can beat them i can beat anybody and and all of them hooped no they all play football is the reason i i played football for a while i played my brother jerry was like the second black quarterback at our high school okay. in the 70s so you know they wasn't letting brothers yeah. call shots and so i was his wide receiver for a long time and then uh, we were playing, and I did a button hook, caught the ball. When I turned around, I got creamed. I took I took my Raider helmet off and started walking home. He was like, you a Sally. You can't just quit like that. I go, I'm going to the gym. And I never left the gym. <laughs> you were, what, 14, 15 at that time? 
Yeah, man. I'm 14 years old. That was it. I was 12 when I decided I was going to be a pro. At 14, I was sure the only pro I wanted to be was professional basketball player. Just like LeBron, all of us want to play football. It's an American sport. But outside, the women can't see you in jerseys. A whole lot of sweaty men. Not my, not my style. When I um when I was coaching at Montverde Academy, then once I got to college, like I would have a lot of eighth graders and seventh graders that I was coaching. And early on, you can kind of tell who has the potential, not just skills wise, but height wise. But they don't know yet. It's like the kids, you people would be surprised at these six, eight, six, nine, six, ten kids. They're still kids, like they don't really understand what they have. Did yeah. you know what you had at an early age, or when did it kick in that you were like, you know what, shit, I might be able to make some money hooping? This is deal. I wasn't tall. I didn't get tall until like I was fifteen. Like fifteen, I grew four inches that summer, and then uh, I was getting tall. And I played guard, small forward. I played every position. And then when I grew into this height, I still had the mentality of a guard. So if I grabbed a rebound, I was dribbling it up court. It, all the way until I got into the pros with Chuck Daly at Detroit was like, listen, we have this all-star on our team named Isaiah Thomas. When you grab the rebound, find him. Exactly. And, and I was like, but I can dribble. He said, find him. So <laughs> <laughs> so it, that was the mentality. I think, if, you know, God rest his soul, Pearl Washington used to say, we all came a long way, but Sal, you came the longest because – my body was was going through so many things. It was growing pains. I was I was awkward in, in certain things, and then uh, I turned that ugly duckling into being um, using the first step and using my my length, getting to the basket, rebounding, blocking shots, and and dunking on people. It was a big thing for me to dunk on people. When you dunk on people, you take a lot of oomph out of that player, uh, um, even though it's just two points. The only person that really doesn't bother to get dunked on is Alonzo Mourning. He doesn't care. You dunk on him, he grabs a boy, he throws it out of bounds. It's just two points. But in my park, in Canarsie, in Bayview Project, you get dunked on, you got to get out of the park for like five minutes. <laughs> we got Yeah, you got to get out. Who was the first person that you dunked on that you was like, yeah, get your ass out, nigga? Oh, I couldn't even begin. You know, it's funny, Dorian. I don't remember not one game I've ever played in. I don't remember any championship games because I had the same mentality about every game. Whoever's in front of me has to die. So it didn't make a difference uh, to me when I played the game. It was like, like if I asked you when the first time you stood up and peed, you wouldn't remember. That's true. That's how it was to me. Basketball is like, it was just like, you know, a regular function of my life. Um, but there was a lot of people, and I tried to dunk on everybody. And then I tried to check the internet to see if there's any videos of Michael Jordan dunking on me. And yeah, he got me once, um, really good. And uh, but put him on his back most of the time. Just thought I'd let you know that. Yeah, we all we all <laughs> saw that shit. That's why that was the main reason I didn't like y'all. Cause my dad and my uncle, they ain't like y'all, even though y'all from the Midwest and they was from Ohio. But y'all was just whooping his ass so much. It's like, man, we ain't fucking with the Pistons. But we'll eventually get, get, get <laughs> to that. I want you to kind of talk about, man, because I don't think – I have a younger audience too. And they don't hoop outside, which things have changed drastically. And I, they don't truly understand New York basketball neither because the past 20 years, facts are facts, New York basketball ain't what it once was. Like, why do you think that is? And then can you kind of explain what it was like you coming up being 12, 13, 14 – going to your park and how you got baptized by fire? Yeah, the, the deal is this. They don't really go outside because they don't have a reason anymore. When when the digital age came into effect, you got the kids who were usually outside working their best at being athletes or whatever. They're now EA sports athletes. You got guys that, <laughs> who are great at Madden. You know, you got to sit in the house. You can't be outside and learn to play video games. So the video games took away a lot of outside work on people. Very Secondly, true. in New York, when you play uh, in the street, that's a different that's a different hustle. So you can still go to the Rucker right now. You go to the Rucker uh, starting in July, and you can see guys who should be in the NBA. And I used to see that all the time. I played in every park in New York City, just about well-known park, except the Cage in West 4th Street Park and the Rucker. And that's because... Uh, I already had a reputation. I didn't need to build it anymore. <laughs> Who was the best player that you saw 
playing all them parts. Carl Washington. By far, hands down. I saw Fly Williams, who decided he could make more money in the street than he can in the NBA, and he said that. Yeah. And World Be Free, oh, my God, World Be Free was was off the chain. Um, is uh, played for Philadelphia, in case you young cats don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't get to see Bernard King or Albert King play in the street, but I played with Pearl, and, and Pearl was – putting it down at 14 with grown men. So when we were like 17, he, he was still the man. And we played gaucho. So we play in gaucho. We play some games outside, most of the games inside. And this was before the three point shot, right? Yeah. You had to you had to you had to earn your points too. And it wasn't a foul when you got hit in the middle. Not like now. Like uh the reason the NBA is like it is now is because each guy is uh, I guess worth what some companies are worth. exactly so, it's, yeah. um, so you can't you can't you can't get so rough with uh playing outside and like getting used and like getting beat up and all that did was there ever a time where you were like you know what i don't know if this shit's for me man because these niggas are out here crazy never <laughs> I, I i never like i was mad i had to go to college damn i'm happy i went i was happy i went but Think about it now. The NBA has started a new league that's literally my boy Brian Shaw is one of the coaches. It's a transition league as opposed to sending a player to Europe. Come, um, Mello and his brother, uh, LeVar's kids, um, yeah. Balls, yeah. when yeah. they went overseas, mm-hmm. in, the, in the time they went overseas, their game grew four years. Very true. So because you play at a level where people are playing for a living, you're playing. Because guys have to win in order to keep that money going. So you, you're brought into a, a situation of being an adult. Tony Parker, at 15 years old, played pro basketball in France. His father was the coach. Mm-hmm. His father wrote his son a check. So Tony Parker was a pro way before he got to San Antonio. And it was and Pop knew that. Pop let him run the show. Same with Luca, and people are wondering yeah. why why Luca's been able to do what he's done. He's been playing pro since he was thirteen. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like you just said, it's totally different when you're playing grammar school, high school, college for free, as opposed yeah. to when like yo, I gotta feed my family off of this. And what I've heard, I haven't been to New York, but back then, like the New York street games, some of y'all was paying to feed your family too, because it was niggas that was on the sideline had a lot of stuff riding on that. Can you kind of elaborate without throwing people under the bus about the finances of? New York street basketball. I don't know what you're talking about, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I played for a guy. He, he got, I got over 300 years in jail. Uh, he was bigger than Nicky Barnes. His name is uh, Fat Jack. And Fat Jack uh, would pay us, you know, 3,000 a game. Shit! We, we went down to, uh, I was 21. We went down to Philadelphia. Uh, no, Washington, D.C. It was a great game. I played against Graham. He used to play against uh, Georgetown. And mm-hmm. he was, oh, and everybody knew I would play at Georgia Tech. And I was, you know, I was friends with Lenny Bias. I had to put on a show, but we wound up losing. Uh, but those guys are putting up big dough. And they wasn't mad because they couldn't say, yo, you didn't do your job. So I did. We did our job. We played. And that's the way it's supposed to be. If you If you put that much effort into it, that was my big fight about college ball. College ball, they're making so much money off of, off of college athletes. Tons of it. They sell their jerseys. They sell their posters. They sell uh, knickknacks about them. They have them show up. The games are on television. Yeah. Millions of dollars. Yeah. So when they say, hey, at least you're getting a free scholarship out of it. Well, let's think about that. When I went to school, scholarships, uh, I guess it cost under $50,000 for five years of school, four years of school. Yeah. My first game on television, CBS, at Georgia Tech in 1982 against uh, Virginia, I think they made something like $14 million between both schools. So my scholarship and anybody else's to follow me was already paid for. And what is a scholarship? They're going to make you go. They're, they're paying that you don't have to pay for books. You don't have to pay for the classes. But in, but in return... I'm giving entertainment, yeah. which is valued more than the scholarship. And then they said in Division One, when you have a scholarship, you could um, uh, the reason the Division One pays for Division Two and Division Three. Yeah. 
is why they're getting rid of Division Three sports. As we speak, there's no more Division Three sports. They're not funded because the NCAA was like, if we got to pay these players, we can't take care of this. And they're going to have to pay the players. This is entertainment. People come in and spend tons of money just like they do to go to a professional, but they spend more in college because there's so many things that other people can get involved with. The, the, the um, uh, what do you call that before the game? Um, what do you call it when they're in the parking lot making all that oh, tailgate tailgating, tailgating. Yeah. they got booster clubs yeah they're wearing they're wearing their sweatshirts their t-shirts they got their flags all of that money goes back to the university for my entertainment i provide oh, excuse me i provided that entertainment yeah so when you know that they they had to go and eventually and play and pay for it. even where they still use your likeness. So when they recruit players, they point at your poster. They show what you've done, mm -hmm. especially if you've gone to the pros. Yep. So they use you even when you're not there. They should pay for that. And you don't get a fucking dime, which is why I totally agree with you that they need to get paid, which is why all this shit happened. And going back to New York City high school basketball at that time, one thing that I know, and I was young, I was born in 84, but I'm a historian of, of, of basketball. There was this direct pipeline from Georgia Tech, from New York City to Georgia Tech. So I, I knew Ste I knew Stefan, and then I knew Kenny Anderson. And then when I got old, I'm like, damn, John Sally went to? What the hell was going on? Who was it? Why was y'all going to Atlanta? Because Atlanta's not like how it is now. What did you do? Like, what did you set off? How'd that happen? Well, I was the first player to sign with Coach Crimmins. Okay. So he said, if I sign you, I'd be able to get a really good point guard. This kid, Mark Price, we're looking at and too. some other players to fill around. So he said, Doug, this can be like the A train from New York, from New York straight <laughs> down to Atlanta. And, you know, Kenny Anderson, you know, that was my man's in them. So that was that. Stefan Marbury was around me when he was six years old. His brother Don used to play with me and we played gaucho. He also played gaucho. So it became a school known for guards because Mark Price was a uh, leading scorer in the ACC our rookie year, and he had a great career. We had uh, Bruce Dalrymple, um, uh, Brian Oliver wind up coming in, Craig Neal. Did so the then Dennis Scott came in as a shooting guard with, with Michael Christian. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then that Kenny Anderson time, they go to the Final Four. Well, then it was Stefan's time and it was he came back in. And if you come into the city of Atlanta, I think the city of Atlanta is not what it should be, what it used to be. It was a it was a small country town and it was great. Now, you know, in the 80s, it was the big flush from uh, the Midwest and from New York. They went down there and New Yorkers went in and like, took over. So it's like a and it is a, a large African um uh, community, uh, but where there were racists when I was at Georgia Tech in 1982, now is a completely black neighborhood. My matter of fact, I moved my mom's out to Stone Mountain, God rest her soul. Before, when I she was like, Stone Mountain, I said, Mom, we can't be in Stone Mountain, they, they got clan meetings on Stone Mountain. Yeah. You go to Stone Mountain now, there's black people walking up and down, hiking. Uh, they still got their Dixie flags. You know, I, I wanted to go and start a uh, uh a match uh, giving situation. And every time you see a Dixie flag, just put it on fire. Let's see what happens. <laughs> That's just crazy, man, for people to think about how Atlanta like didn't want us. And now they can't exist without us. I think yes. Atlanta's like 58% black, which is the most out of anybody. I think DC might be right there too. Yeah. When I was coaching, man, every coach that I met at Georgia Tech, assistant coaches, I'm not going to say their names, because um, they've fallen off drastically. And they've said the reason is because there's no academics they can really put students in, like athletes in. Like when you come to Georgia Tech, it's engineering, it's some hard shit. How was Bobby Crimmins? I know all y'all were no damn engineers. Like, what did Bobby Crimmins do? I well, so the difference is this is this is what I tell cats. When we when we recruit you at Georgia Tech, we recruit student athletes. Exactly. You have to be a student before you're an athlete. And the ones that can do it, I mean. Look at Richard Sherman. Richard Sherman went to uh, Stanford. Yeah, and to shit. get in Stanford, you can't have less than a B your whole senior year in high school, yep. your whole your whole career in high school. So they're very um, – um, the quarterback uh, that was at uh, the Colts, the, the, what was his Andrew name? Luck. 
Andrew Luck, brilliant. You got to you got to be in that position. And so when they would say they couldn't get athletes uh, because they didn't have the grades, well, in a way that's true. And the other thing is you have to get athletes with great work ethic. I wanted to have a degree. I wanted to give my mother. I was going to leave school early. So when I got my degree, I graduated two years after I graduated, after I left to go into the pros, I gave my mother my degree. Like oh, you wow. wanted it. Here it is. I accomplished it. I ain't going to use it. Well, I wind up using it now, but I, I didn't think that was what I wanted. That wasn't my career. It was a step you had to make. And that's the point I was making about the transition lead that the NBA is doing now that my boy Brian Charles, one of the coaches of, is you, you just have to transition you into what you do. Think about um, – Jermaine O'Neal, yeah. uh, uh, shoot, Kevin Garnett, Kobe Bryant, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, uh, Zach Randolph, Dial mm -hmm. Dawkins, Moses Malone. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of places that you may not have to go to college. But if your career is going to be in athletics, then yeah. You, and the guy said, well, what happened if you get hurt? Well, you can always go back to college as an institution. Mm -hmm. And the way the world is now, school is digital. Is that so? You. You might as well figure out a digital way and do what you love to do. I think one thing people don't realize, too, about college scholarships, and when I have these debates about paying kids, those college scholarships aren't four years guaranteed. They're one year renewable. So the coaches have this leverage that they hang over the kids' heads. Like, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, I'm not going to renew your scholarship. And I didn't know that until I got onto a D1 staff and I was talking to the head coach, and he gave me the scholarship papers to take to the compliance office and I'm looking at it and he says, you see two people, they ain't coming back. I'm like, but they had the grades, they had everything. He said, we need the room for, for somebody else. It's, it's so fucked up, man, that people yes. don't realize all this stuff that goes on into college basketball, the pimping, the not getting the likeness, and then the education is not even guaranteed because the coach don't like you. He just snatched your shit. Exactly. And then this is the deal. Even if you get to education, you got to get online with the other 30 million kids that graduate. So imagine this. You go and you get a degree in political science. Mm -hmm. Right. What is the first thing they say you're going to be? You're going to law school. Yep. You're going to politics like that, that. You have that route of going. Right. Uh, you get a you get a degree. You have to go to a job fair. You have to hopefully you get you had an internship that worked out for you. It's this 30 million people you have to compete against, if not more, because you got the people from other countries coming in from that want the jobs as well. So you're literally paying four hundred thousand dollars to ask somebody for a job. That's ridiculous. Bullshit is what it is. That's why you have your podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, and I got a master's degree and my mama watching right now. I've like, been telling her friend. For years, like, I should have never went to went to college, but it is what it is. So you and you in college got the New York City Connects, like you the next one. Everybody supporting you back home. Bobby Krim, as I've heard, was a was a player's coach. Everybody loved him. Um, but college students are broke. So what was you doing for money? Like how was you making it survive better? Because y'all had to stay three, four years back then. Yeah, uh, we didn't have to, but we yeah, you stayed three, four. Well, you couldn't get a job in the summer, but you can get a job in the summer doing things like basketball camps yep, yep so but that's only 175 a week and then uh um the best thing is my brother jerry would send me 50 dollars here 50 i can stretch a dollar and <laughs> you don't get to do a lot of things but if you're at the right places like i hear um I hear. I, i'm not going to say the school but there's a school in uh tennessee in the town that that uh elvis came from uh, the, my boy William Befford had two cars, a condo, didn't go to class, and have money in the pocket. And mm -hmm. I was like, "Wow, wow!" But and I said to Coach Crimmins, I said, "Did you know that these guys and what he said, Sal? If those guys get busted, that's going to be on their head for the rest of their life because you don't need that. You don't need that." He said, "What do you, he said? When you get out of here, you can buy any car you want, and then no one's going to come back." He said, "You don't want to do anything." to tarnish our great reputation at this school for the future. So I always looked at it that way. I always looked at, I was, may have been the pioneer and pioneer gets all the arrows, but you also get all the medals. Dorian. 
There we go. All right. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you I said, so go, go ahead. I'm sorry. So my, I said, so the best thing I may have gotten all the arrows, but I also got all the medals. So when you go to Georgia Tech and you're inside uh, Alexander Memorial Coliseum, you look up there, you see John Sally, number 22, hanging. So I, I was able to take my number and be the last one to wear it. What what'd you study at uh, Georgia Tech? Industrial management with a minor in marketing. What the hell is industrial management? So industrial management is literally if I were looking for a job, I would know how to manage people inside factories, inside okay. uh, organizing large amount of people. So industrial business like that was that's right now. The school of management is what they call it. So I went and I didn't I didn't study um, uh, engineering. We took engineering courses. We took textile engineering, um, chemical engineering, uh, one or two. I think it wasn't even electrical engineering, but textile, those thought, uh, type of engineering. The rest was literally how to manage, how to do business. One of my favorite teachers is Dr. Adler. Dr. Adler didn't even have a book. You had to read the newspaper and find notes from other people and read those notes because he was going to go back and ask you because he had it in his brain. That's then good. it was Dr. Yancey, um, when she was at Georgia Tech, we did an African-American study. She became the president of uh, Bethane Cookman. Like these teachers, like I can mention those two, those two teachers literally made you learn it, not study it. Just study it. You learned it. That's that's education. I think. Yes. I know for my generation, it was just about re I got to remember this shit. I got to answer the questions right on the on the test. As soon as I walk out the classroom, you ask me the same question. I just got right. I can't even tell you. But true that. But the fact that they were making you actually learn and pulling in current events and all that that's mm -hmm. that's amazing man and i wish more teachers did that but like you just said about basketball i even think in our education system too we've had the same education system since world war one and, <laughs> and, 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 and it's the same books exactly black communities yeah black communities the same book and, and so like it's not adapting and i think that's why a lot of people my generation was the first ones that when we came out of college like college degree didn't mean jack jack shit and I think that's why it is because the education system, they just keep pumping us with this shit. It's just not useful. That's amazing. That they were actually giving you stuff that you can use, even yeah. though you end up playing in the, in the NBA. Yeah, yeah definitely. I, I tell you this, uh, my, my daughter learned a lot in school and I put her, she was in a school called New Roads and New Roads, there's no test. And they were like, no test. It was $30,000 a year for a senior year in high school. Um, but the, the best thing about it is your test was you being an orator and speaking and talking about what you learned and explaining it and doing slides, literally involving yourself in it from your point of view and explain it. And the teacher graded you on your explanation and understanding of it. Now, if you just have, which I found to be crazy, and I've only heard this, i not, I know it to be true. So at a very smart school like Berkeley, mm -hmm. they have classes that had 3,000 students in God dang, come on, man. I said the same thing. I said, you? he said, oh, it's this huge auditorium that held. And, and I said, well, how are you learning? And he goes, well, a lot of times I just, you know, took everybody's notes after, you know, when it came time to study for the, for the test. I said, did you go in your classroom? He said, no. Some of the, most of the classes we did, I went in the class digitally. Now this is at Berkeley. So if you're at Berkeley and you're in class digitally and it's time to take a test and you finally go into class to take the test, yeah. you're taking a test on what you were told or you can read the book all you want. If the teacher doesn't jot out the things that you need to know, you're not going to know what's necessary. So it's important to get with somebody who has really good notes and read those notes. And when you go to take a test, you pass the test. That means you didn't learn anything. You just remembered for a short period of time mm -hmm. so you can take the test. There's a difference of learning and just studying. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Going back to Georgia Tech, man, I think this dude who you mentioned earlier, I don't think he gets enough respect because he wasn't very flashy in the NBA. And he was brought up in an era where he pay, played for the Cavs. Mike kept beating mm -hmm. their ass. But I don't think people understand how much of a savage Mark Price was. Can you kind of elaborate on that? I put it this way. Michael Jordan in 1983. Um, Tosh, turn this light on. Um, the 1983, 1983 was the leading score in the ACC. And so, thank you. So imagine 
MJ was pissed that he was one percentage point less than, than, than Mark Price. So he beat MJ out in the scoring title, and he's six foot one, maybe six foot. And he could shoot the ball lights out. He had some games that didn't show that, but then it was games where he just would come down. He could dribble. He was quick. He can pass, uh, but he can put the ball in the basket. He was an unbelievable teammate. Before you got to college, had, had you played with white players before? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, I, I played against and with uh, – uh, I played, you know, I played all over. So, but in my high school team, I think there was there was no white kids. Uh, on Gauchos, there was no white kids. Yeah. But in my neighborhood, so we were the second black family to move into Bayview houses. Oh damn. So yeah, I, I played with uh, guys. I learned with all the Jewish kids. You know, pump, pass, pass. Wait till you get a good shot. All of that stuff helped me. Um, uh, in my in my other life, because my coach Ted Gustus, Ted Gustus, what's up? He got this thing called One Breath. Uh, Ted made us practice one time. He said, "No one go for a steal. Nobody go for a steal." And he said, "Play with your hands behind your back." And then, sure enough, one of those guys, the boy, just stuck his hand out. He goes, "Why we always got to steal something on the line?" And everybody had to run suicides until he felt that we learned. You don't have to steal anything. It was a stealing <laughs> town. And I tell him to this day, I said, you remember that time you made us feel bad about stealing the ball? He said, hey, he said, I bet you, you play great defense. I said, yeah, I still go for steals, though. He goes, yeah, but in the game, you can do it. But in practice, focus. Focus on just playing the game and play the game fundamentally. If you got your fundamentals, oh, my God, and you put some mustard on it, you looking good. You LeBron all day. LeBron is fundamentally Kobe, fundamentally sound. Uh, Damon Lillian, fundamentally sound. Yeah, that's how you build upon it. So you're listed at six eleven, right? Six eleven three quarters. Yeah, it, that's is, is is that your real height or is that what you listed at? No, it's my real height. I was wanting seven foot. So <laughs> I would I would and, and when you when you're at the Pistons, they 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 measure you flat foot. Oh damn. When you, when you go everywhere else, they measure you with your sneakers on. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you six eleven three quarters. You can yeah. dribble. You can pass. You understand the game. Agents are coming around. I know now when 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 you in college. Hell, it's fucking college. A you now. Kids have runners. Kids have agents. Then what was the process like for you when you realized, oh shit, I'm about to play in the NBA? And how how'd you pick an agent and all that? Uh, my boy. Uh, Dwayne Martin, you know, the actor, he yeah. was part of a, a, a company with my boy Rock, who was a coach at Lincoln at the time. And they came and recruited me and, and took me a couple of places and told me how much they were out of Boston, how great they would be. I thought I was going to be a Celtic. And then the Celtics took uh, Led Bias uh, number two. And I waited, you know, a whole nine more drafts. That was cool because I made everybody that didn't draft me in yeah. the, uh, until 11 pay for it. And then, um, uh, we had a, a my coach's law agent, you know, was courting me and, you know, telling me what he can do for me. And um, I told him not to go with him and which probably would I probably should have. But I picked David Falk. David Falk represented. He was a pro serve at the time. He had 27 players. He represented MJ, James Worthy, uh, Patrick Ewan, Lonzo Morning, Dikembe, uh, Buck Williams. Uh, Johnny Dawkins, all of us, uh, we went with we went with David Falk. David Falk, the best agent, period. Why is that? Because David Falk is about his player. And this is the craziest thing. You got to realize a lot of agents who have a player know they're going to have other players want to be – they want the general managers to like them. Uh, David Falk was like, this is this player. This is what he gets. This is how he's going to move it. This that He had a plan. So when he left ProServe and and started his own, you knew when David went and he was going to fight for you. It was funny. In the last dance, you'll see when David – David was the one that came up with the word Air for Air Jordan. Yeah. Um, he just wished he would have copyrighted it. Back then, he didn't know that much about it. But uh, David Falk, great guy. So you got drafted to Detroit, right? Yes, sir. Number yes. 11. Okay. So when you get to Detroit – 
a culture is huge in basketball. And I don't think people understand in the NBA, there's a different culture in every team. There's a reason why the same teams keep winning. What did you notice about the Detroit Pistons culture when you when you got there? Uh, Bill and Bear walks up to you and says, we are a serious basketball team and we want to do this and we uh -huh. want to do that. And we are going to move like this. And at first you're thinking, what is this guy talking about? And then you realize they to have Bill, Isaiah, and then I had Adrian Dantley. Adrian Dantley was like my my guru, man. Mm -hmm. I think I think the reason I'm even here today is Adrian Dantley. He taught me different things about food, how to train your body, the mental capacity you have to have when you're playing. AD really put it down. So I had great veterans who weren't trying to hold me back because they were trying to get their shine on. I had veterans who looked out for me. Back then, like there wasn't nutritionists and mental health therapists. So what y'all do? Did y'all have to cook your own food? Like strip joints. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the deal. So I'm, I'm with Adrian Danley and you know, back then the rookie were, during preseason would room with a, um, a vet mm -hmm. and the NBA like had gotten rid of roommates. So we all paid. We all wound up getting our own singles. And A.D. said, young fella, I'm going to buy you lunch. We're in Milwaukee. And I'm like, oh, you're going to buy me lunch. Yeah. He said, go ahead, order whatever you want. I order next. I said, all right, anything I want. So I got a hamburger with cheese, French fries and a strawberry shake. He starts laughing. I said, what you laughing at? That's what I want. He said, okay. He said, all right, uh, hand him the phone. And he goes, uh, bring me up a half a sandwich and some soup. And at 4.30, bring me another sandwich and some soup. Yeah. And they were like, huh? He said, I'm doing two orders. And I'm ordering it now. I want them separated. So at 1.30, he had half a sandwich and some soup. Usually go to sleep like 2.30 to 4 o'clock, get your two hour, two hour, hour and a half nap in. I ate that cheeseburger like I had never eaten before. <laughs> and he said, young fella, don't forget to bring that bag over when you come over. Because back then, you stayed in a hotel across the street from the Mecca, from the arena, and you would yeah. walk over. Got to be there by 6. So I said, all right. I set my alarm. I get up at like 5.15. I'm dragging. AD is already getting treatment. He's already over. I'm carrying his bag, my bag. I get in there. And I write down who I want to come. I get in the game. And I'm playing against Jack Sigma. Now, Jack Sigma is uh, tall like Frankenstein. People called him Frankenstein. He had this great inside pivot. He was going around me, beating me up and down court. I'm missing dunks. I'm not playing. And Chuck Dale is like, what's wrong with you? Would you have a girl in your room or something? And AD was like, nah. How's that cheeseburger handling? <laughs> I said, what? He said, man, your body can do one thing at a time. Yeah. It it wants to digest. And I did I realized he said, your body's gonna be digesting for the next six hours, not playing basketball. Damn. You gotta watch what you eat before you play, young fella. But I needed you to see this. From that point on, I mean, that was 1986. By 1991, I was I was in the macrobiotics and becoming a vegetarian. And now I'm a vegan. Uh, literally more raw vegan. So I literally know what gas I put in this high octane car. That was I was just about to ask, was that pivotal to making you become a vegan? But obviously it was. Damn. Well, yeah, it was one of them. Another one went out in 1990. Um, yeah, 1990. My cholesterol was 273. And it was guys on the team that were 15 years older than me that had better cholesterol. Oh wow! So they were going to put me on a pill. And they said the pill causes impotence. I then found out that if you don't have to take any pharmaceuticals, uh, medicine is a food, food is a medicine. Yeah. And once I got a colonic, I was full of shit. I was full of shit. I was full of seriously harmful intestinal toxins. And once I cleaned my colon and started feeding my body food that it can work on, man, there you go. Another 10 years in the league. So even during the bad boys era, you weren't eating hamburgers and shit, but you weren't fully vegetarian yet. So what was your diet? I was a lying vegetarian. I was eating uh, mostly vegetables, and then you would have this baked over here or this over here, thinking, well, you need a little bit of fish. You need a little bit of chicken. You need a little bit of meat. That's not true. I, I just stopped eating dead shit. If you don't eat dead shit, 
trust me, it won't. You, you don't. I don't want to use my body as a coffin. Yeah. And everybody that sees, yeah, man, but, you know, what about the protein? I hear that all the time. You get more. So protein is great. But if you're it's like, what about what about the Ferrari? Great. You can't afford the Ferrari. So talking about the Ferrari and trying to get to the Ferrari doesn't make any sense. Right. We need to talk about things that make sense. But if you have a Ferrari, you're going to put high octane gas in it. Right. So you need to treat your body like a Ferrari not make your body like a coffin how are you doing your research because this is the 80s ain't no youtube obviously there's minimal publications about this and from our community you tell people you're not eating meat i mean they riding your ass like what the fuck's yeah. wrong with hippie nigga like how did you wh where were you getting all your research like how and what gave you the fortitude to do that there's a bunch of books and i know they used to say if you want to hide it from a black man put it in the book my mother yeah. said that was a saying so i read a ton of books and that's why behind me You'll see just some of, but if I would turn the camera that way, there's a ton of books. Okay, and and the green print is one you should get. Uh, Carnell West. What I tell people in our community, this is this is an important thing to say too. We're still eating slave food. Yes, and don't want to be considered slaves. Then stop doing things that slaves do. Stop eating slave food. Uh, the reason you eat. Chitlins, the reason you eat gizzards, the reason you eat tongue, tail, uh, um, uh, what else, pig feet, uh, the reason you eat that because those are the things that Massa used to throw away. So the slaves used to go scavenge that and then make it and eat it. Not that they, it, they made it a delicacy, they were hungry. And so they were down to their last bit, they were eating the insides, the guts of animals. That, that's the craziest thing in the world. But the real diet, which you know, rice, beans, cornbread, collard greens, uh, squash, corn, uh, tomato, sacatosh, that was that. So that's how we supposed to eat. We supposed to eat things that you grow. And during the pandemic, it was a proven fact. Uh, Elon Musk said it funny. At one time, cannabis was a felony. Now it's an essential because it's a plant. The fact that they even said a plant could not be uh, put in your body is the craziest part of it. So it's very important that people understand the food you eat makes you. And what I mean by that is if you eat a live electric food, you will be alive and electric. If you eat things that are dead, it won't work. If you had a boom box that needed 20 uh, D batteries, D motherfucker D, if you needed <laughs> D batteries and the batteries die, the, there's no boom. So you got to have the electric electricity in what you put into the boom box. That's, this is my boom box. I have to put electric foods in. I have to put, so like from 11 to two, I'm eating a ton of fruit. In the morning, I'm drinking almost all water. I have a, a company I'm with called Spirulina for Life. Um, it's a spirulina that's alive, so it doesn't stink. And it's alive. So it's frozen, but it's frozen in this cryo state. Then when you put it in water, it melts, it comes, it's right back to life. It's, it's not like dehydrated and you try to add something to it. The worst thing that can ever happen to an athlete is dehydration. Yes. Uh, so when they dehydrate things and say it's good for you, I don't see it that way. So for people that are watching right now, we got a lot of people commenting about the vegan diet. And everybody's been ever since that documentary. Uh, I forget what, what the hell. About. Yeah. What exactly. the hell. And then the new one is called my, my brother-in-law, PJ Jenkins. He was with me when I first started talking this vegan stuff. 2009, 2008. I, I 2007, 2008, I got into it. 2009, I hit the road with it. Um, and then since then, become an animal activist. He just saw Game Changers four weeks ago, and he changed his diet at the end of the movie. At the end of the movie, he became a vegan. And he said, I know you've been telling me for 13 years, Sal, but that movie explained it a little bit different. So if you want to see something, watch game changers it's on youtube it's on uh netflix game changers the next one to watch is what the health what the health is super important and if you really want to get down to it watch earthlings earthlings my daughter was 13 we watch earthlings she's never eaten an animal since i just that's why i put that third i want to get your health first and then i want to get to your moral consciousness to understand if you're really about uh this movement of stopping trafficking, stopping people from being 
uh, put into a situation because a way they look, you'll stop eating meat. Because when you see the penitentiaries, they have them in. And when you find out that in America, the meat you eat has feces on it, even when you get it from the grocery store, yeah, it should pay attention. You should pay attention. You should pay attention. Everybody that becomes a vegan saves 7,500 land animals from death every year. So, so you're making a comparison to the prison industrial complex with how animals get treated with the with the meat, and, and so so you're saying like when people will watch these documentaries, that's gonna make them understand basically have more empathy for humans too. Yeah, the reason why is what is the reason? All right, Dave Chappelle on YouTube, you should see when they said he uh, he kind of got this white lady set her straight as a uh, she was heckling him. And he went down the line of why he was nervous when a police officer pulled him over. And he had all the reasons to be. Think about this. If you have a dog or a cat, you rub and cut. You don't even think about eating your dog or cat. Yes. But what's the difference between your dog and cat and a cow, a pig, and a bird? Nothing. They want to live too. So when you sit around and you, and you say, well, you know, it's a dog. You don't eat dog. It's the same thing. It has ribs, had a heartbreak, has sex, has babies, even a cow, even a pig, even a chicken. If you want to eat the menstrual cycle of a chicken, I'm sorry. If you want to eat eggs, if that's what you would do, <laughs> you're into. But, but you have to think about this. The way this is the same way we're doing, we're talking about now, right? We, we, they call it white privilege. So then it's dog and cat privilege, but no cow, horse, pig, fowl, fish. Like, why do you choose which one of those? They're just animals, right? Well, there's a difference. There's, a, there, there's no difference. It's the same thing. There's no difference between white people and black people. Just the thought. It's the thought. We're all human. We're all mammals. Only predators eat other mammals. That's their job. There's, there's, a, there's a snake that will come near you five feet long. You'll be like, oh, my God. And look down, it's a rat snake. You can walk right next to it. It ain't going to do nothing to you because it eats rats. That's its job. Tigers, lions, bears, oh, my. Bears, scavengers. Uh, this girl said, well, you know, I'm a Presbyterian. I don't eat shellfish. I said, well, do you eat roaches? She goes, no, that's disgusting. That's what I go, are. well, you eat the roaches out of the sea. Why don't you eat the roaches on the ground? Once you make people realize what they're dealing with and how, you start paying attention. Plus, a lot of people in this country are Christians. And it, and the Christians usually only talk about the New Testament because that was written by them. Yep. But if you deal with the real part and you deal with the Old Testament, the first thing the Bible tells you as, an, as a human is the animals are for you to name. The fruit and the trees are what you should eat from. God said so. So you sit around and said, yeah, but my doctor said it's okay. Your doctor is a drug addict and a drug pusher. <laughs> He's not. His job is to make you come back. If your doctor gives you things that make you not come to him, he don't need to be a doctor. He, he was like, oh, I might as well be a farmer because if I tell you how to stay healthy, there's no use for me. So understand where you're getting your information. And if anybody says you need the protein, you're a liar. Protein is more uh, bioavailable for a human body out of fruits, nuts, seeds, legumes, and vegetables. It is not bioavailable out of red meat. What's bioavailable out of red meat when you eat it is B12. That's because the blood from that animal is synthesized and your body can recognize it. The rest of it, the body goes, well, this is flesh. He must be eating himself. We're not going to digest this. That's why you get that belly. That's why you get those rolls in the back. That's why you get those jowls. That's why your penis doesn't want to work. That's why your farts stink. That's why your feet stink. That's why you can't wear shoes that you used to wear or clothes you used to wear. And that's why you get mad at people who are thin because you let yourself. And I'm not fat shaming. I'm just telling you the reason you expand and swell is because your body will not process some of the food you're putting in. When your body does what it's supposed to, it's a processor, you will be exactly the weight you're supposed to be. You won't have to buy new clothes. You won't have to cover your shirt when you go to the beach with a t-shirt that's way too big. You won't have to be embarrassed to take your clothes off. Now, those kind of people say, well, I'm fat. I'm not embarrassed to take my clothes off. That's great. But if you're making yourself unhealthy, it's yeah, not. Exactly. 
a lot of people, I know the arguments for a lot of folks is it's like there's unhealthy vegans or vegan food is yeah. like too expensive. What does John Sally know? He played in the NBA. He man, he's rich. He has access to all this shit. Like, what do you say to people about how to be a healthy vegan and an affordable vegan? Because people still want the taste, but sometimes when they say the shit that tastes good is vegan, is not healthy for you? Okay, that's funny they say that. First, I start off like this. If you eat Beyond Meat burgers and you don't like that it's made in the lab and it's made with all these different things, pea protein and lipids and, and aminos that you need, if you don't, if, if that's that, if it's between eating Beyond Meat and eating a burger because you want that texture, eat the Beyond Meat. Because if you eat the burger from a cow, look at all the things you have. You have the disease. You have literally um, feces. You have... Uh, no, no bioavailability. And you killed something just so you can like the taste. Crazy. Give you an example. And if you really like it, I'll give you one piece of chicken. I ain't going to cook it. Eat it. You're going to be like, nah, man. Exactly. Why not? Because it's not cooked. I go, we're the only species on the planet that cooks this food. So if that's the case, you don't want it. Here goes some barbecue sauce, some lemon pepper for the black folks, some, some buffalo for the white folks. Here goes some ranch. Here go everything you put on, masala, all the stuff you put on the chicken to get that taste. It's not the chicken you like. You like the taste. Very so true. just put that taste on something else. If it's the texture you like, then there's a ton of textures. Oyster mushrooms. Literally tastes like calamari. You can bread it and fry it in grapeseed oil. You just like it, and you won't know the difference. So this cauliflower that tastes like buffalo wings, and people say they don't, they're lying because it's only the buffalo taste that you want. Exactly. So when there's, uh, yes, they're going to say they're unhealthy vegans, right? But it's so funny. The ones saying it are the unhealthy people. So the ones eating dead animals are very unhealthy. I don't care if you believe they're healthy. They're not healthy. If you eat something that is dead, how can it give you boom? So you got those meat eaters. They transition over to the processed foods, the burgers and the chickens. Good. I got you out of killing an animal. Now I got you over here. And now you're more awake. You can't talk to people when they sleep, Doria. That's why you got to be woke. So when they're not, when they're asleep, you're talking to somebody who's unconscious, without conscious. So once you get your consciousness and you start paying attention that I'm not going to do that to your body, then you start eating more vegetables, drinking water. That's the biggest thing of all of them. Drink spring water. You drink a gallon of spring water a day, you, we won't have any problems. Mm -hmm. Why do they say eat an apple a day, keep the doctor away? They don't say eat a, a pork chop a day. <laughs> so, so the ones who literally get off of meat and meat and go into the process – Guess what? Around their processed food, they're going to have more vegetables. They're going to have more vegetables. They're going to have less starch, more vegetables. And now they're moving in the direction. I just want them to move in the direction away from murdering innocent animals. I usually don't do this, but this is my aunt. She got a question. Auntie Ree, John, do you have any single vegan male friends? <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't really have any friends. I have constituents and partners. Uh, Yes, I do. I do. I do. But they're looking they're looking for a female with a job. <laughs> my, my, my <laughs> I got a job. <laughs> Auntie Reed, you did that to yourself. <laughs> Hell no. Nah. So when you're in the NBA, this is the 80s, this is the 90s, you learning all this shit. I know you're talking to your teammates and they like, hey man, shut the fuck up. I don't, don't want to hear that. I don't want I'm eating my McDonald's. I'm an all-star. I'm doing all this. Are can are there any teammates specifically? that you converted and they saw a difference, not only in their play, but in their life. Okay, first thing, Christians and religions convert. Uh, I don't convert, but what I do is I'm a living example of the spirit. So what, what, what I mean by that is, I went on a plane when I was with Miami Heat and we were on a private, they wind up getting us a private plane after a while, we chartered a private plane. And these guys were stopping at fast food joints and buying $10 worth of food and getting on the plane. And I told them, as a guy, I said, hey, you can't bring that on the plane. Sal, get out of the way. And then I went and told the general manager, I said, hey, you're going to have to feed them really good food. He goes, what, what, as much as I pay them, they should get their own food. I go, these are your race cars. Exactly. And if, if you're going to treat your race cars like a junkyard, you're going to get junk on the court. 
If you're going to treat it like a NASCAR Formula One, you're going to get champions. The difference, you can't have them eating dollar food with million dollar bodies. Well, they should know better. How would they know better when their whole life they haven't been taught? Mm -hmm. So one of my teammates, Isaiah Thomas, tried it for a while, did really well. Dow Walker, he's now the coach at Clark University, tried it, did really well. It's 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 not even a commitment. It's, a, it's not a, com a hard commitment. It's a commitment to yourself. Keep your sexy going. Dog, check this out. The chances of a man having uh, prostate cancer in his life is 100%. You either have it or you will die from it. Men will have prostate But the important thing is to prolong your arc and try to keep your prostate as small as possible without any bad fluids and without any toxins going into the prostate area. Why I tell men this is one day somebody's going to tap you on the other side of the bed and you ain't going to be able to get up, take a Viagra, wait 15 minutes, drink a half a gallon of water and then go do your job. That's that's the dumbest way of doing it. Think of what happens when you take these these uh, pills that help you right? these male enhancement pills that are good for you. The side effects, death. Yeah. That's one of the side effects. Second side effect, uh, deafness. Second, uh, you go in death. Definitely. Uh, th yeah, third one, eyesight. You lose your eyesight. So you can't even see the holes. You can't hear what they're saying, and you won't be dead. <laughs> so what are you doing? Like, the, the women don't want to sit around and be like, oh, I got to wait to him getting his thing on. Dog. And I found this out a while ago. Dr. Sabi once said it, right? Dr. Sabi, God rest his soul, rest peace, yep. had a baby in the 70s. That means he kept his sperm count where it was supposed to be. He kept his prostate where it was needed to be. His body was able to do the things it's designed to do. Stay alive for at least 150 years. So we always celebrate the centennials. I mean, my mother made it to 96. And, and then at 94, 95, I was like, hey, let's come back out to L.A. and get her. She said, listen, how long you want me to stay alive, Johnny? I got no brothers, sisters, no friends. And, you know, 96 years. She did 96 on this planet. My uncle's at 92 right now. My other aunt, 90, 98. My grandmother lived to 118 years old. She's one of the oldest people on the planet at, at the time before she died. Wow. They ate poorly, but the majority of their food was the food they grow. They grew was they were growing the 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 sacatosh uh, that they were making. They were growing the squash. They were growing the uh, the butter lettuce, the kale, the uh, the tomatoes. All organic nobody was going around and spraying it with roundup mm -hmm. they were doing what they needed to do they didn't care if the leaves were being eaten by the caterpillars the caterpillars needed to live too they were taking the fruit from those plants that's the very important thing to remember we got a question from matrix lee which is really good it goes right in what you're saying why don't more nba players health advisors and specialists convert them to vegan um because uh ignorance is bliss <laughs> <laughs> No, um, not that they don't know. I'm not going to say they're doing that because they don't know. I think a lot of people, it's 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 food is tradition. You got you got certain Italian people go. My mother, my grandmother make the best bolognese. They make the best this. All right. You got the black people like my brother said about my mother's. You make the best fried chicken. I said, you mean you like the seasoning? Yes. Right. So to get out of that, the players that are smart know what they're doing triathletes they pay, they make very sure what they're putting in their body um uh special ops uh special ops that protect us here in america they're raw fooders because they don't have time to sit up on a mountain where they're in a stakeout and cook something and let off their location they have to be able to grab and eat it i tell everybody you want fast food it's called a banana an apple a pear a cherry a grape uh, a Orange. plum, a pukwat, or though that's fast food. So the other thing is death food. That's junk food. So you don't want to put yourself in that situation. Another thing that I learned about you over the years, which you've really helped with the stigma of this, is cannabis. And it seems like that you were a person that was always questioning what the doctors were giving you or like telling you, and then you would go seek your other other solutions. What's been your relationship with cannabis from an early age to when you were an athlete? And then now everything that you're doing, like how did all that evolve? Well, I was raised as a Jehovah Witness. 
And so, you know, when I got out of that, I was still a scaredy cat. I didn't smoke weed until I was 36 years old. I was, I was 30. 20. Okay. Yeah, it was 20 years ago in Sacramento. And um, I smoked it and I went to sleep in my body. I slept nine hours. <laughs> and I said to my teammate, I said, you smoke this all the time? He goes, well, I need to go to sleep, Sal. So from that point on, I started realizing people were afraid because they were going to lose their job and be called a stoner. I got a T-shirt that said stoned and successful because if you're going to if you're going to have something in your body, right, you, people are going to say, well, you can have one or two bottles. Uh, you can have one or two drinks. You can have red wine. You can do whatever. You're constantly putting your liver under under stress. I sell wine, too, but I understand one glass of wine is good for you. Two glasses of wine isn't. But I, I it depends on how big your glass is, too. Yeah. So I, I, I sat there and realized as I was getting going, the reason this thing was vilified as a this a vegetable. It's an unbelievable plant. And it can do so much, so much because of the hemp plant and the cannabis plant. The hemp plant has 200 different resources it can turn into, even concrete. And the cannabis plant is definitely the best food, best relaxation. You go into a product and, oh, my God, I'm so sure I, I need to take a Prozac. Oh, my God, I, I need to take a I, I need to take a Quaalude. Well, they don't have Quaaludes anymore. Okay. I need to take a, uh, I, I need I need a drink. I need a drink to settle my nerves. No, that's feeding the parasite that wants you to keep crystallizing your liver. And once your liver's gone, it's the one organ that can be regenerated. But once your liver gone, that means all the pressures on your pancreas. And once your pancreas is gone, fingers. Yeah. So it's 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 a thing that when I when I smoke cannabis, my daughter Tyler was uh, having migraines and they were given all these pills that I know don't digest and have all other effects to them. When she smoked cannabis, it relieved the pain in her brain immediately. How, how so was she? She was, uh, she first time we caught her smoking, she was 17. And then I was like, why, you know, the reason your mother's mad is you took her weed. Uh, <laughs> if, you <want> <laughs> if you really want some stuff, this is the cabinet. Exactly. Um, <laughs> So since then, we started Deuces 22. You can check us out on deuces22.cannabis on Instagram. Okay. Um, and we launched this month, and we sell only flower. We sell the best Intica, the best hybrid, and the best sativa. Y'all got pre-rolls? Well, that, we, start, we were going to start with pre-rolls, but the reason we didn't is because we couldn't find a container that can keep the weed fresh like we could the container that can keep the weed fresh um, when we put it in the eighth. So when you roll it, you have to break it down, it's drying. You roll it, it's drying. When you put it in, pre-roll is whack. Yeah. That's why people get weed, break it down, put it in a joint and smoke it right away. We wanted that feeling to either get frozen weed, uh, put it in it, put it in a container, hold the moisture so when you light it, it's like you just had rolled it. So we're waiting on our company called Calyx to come up with uh, the packaging for a four pack because we're selling four to eight pre joint pre rolls. But after everybody realizes that we have the premium boutique uh, cannabis, we won't do the other. So I really want to get into the cannabis stuff. I feel like, like you said about the stigma, like I told you, I didn't smoke till I was 30. I was just against it. Didn't, didn't want to get caught. My dad never smoked or drank. I didn't want to hear his mouth coming home smell like weed. I, I, I want to deal with it. But then I got older and everything you were saying, about the pills, about the liquor. I'm like, I just take this shit. If a doctor tell me, I don't even think about it. What and not? So I learned the benefits, and I also see the benefits of like CBD. Can I take that now? How should we train the next generation? I have a daughter; she's 11 months. How should we train the next generation on CBD, THC? Should we introduce it to them? Because you just gave that testimony about your daughter, not the religious term, but you know, what I mean, testimonial. Like, how should we introduce that to them? Because that stigma is still there. They can still get in trouble for it, and it can be deemed ir ir irresponsible if you're doing that as a, as a parent. Well, first things first. Um, one, the doctor never told you to take things. It's mostly other people. Um, you, the saying is, take two of these and call me in the morning. Well, you should figure out you're an organic being. How in the world does a synthetic pill work? Yep. Well, this is how it works. You take it. It goes down in your stomach. Hopefully you have enough assets because 
by the time, let's look at it this way. This is your stomach. And this is the only size of your stomach, the size of your fist, ladies and gentlemen. So let's say that it looks like this with the knuckles. When you're young, your enzymes are here. By the time you're 30, the enzymes are down there almost at empty. Acid reflux, gain of weight, because your body is not breaking it down. So when you take that pill, if your body's not breaking down food, and you take that pill, it finally breaks down, goes to your liver, your body may get 10% of that pill. And because you put it in your mouth, if it's a placebo, even if it is a placebo, if it's not a placebo, your brain believes that that pill is going to make you better. So your body starts working it. But what if you took a plant that has an endo, um, um, uh, what? Well, uh, Indo uh, cabinoid system, right? Yeah. You as a human have a ca uh, indo cabinoid system as well. So if you have a plant that has it and it can enhance, that's how you age your body. Food is that medicine. Medicine is that food. You can't get that food from something dead, and you can't get that from something man-made. That if man made it, it's synthetic. It's not organic. It's not natural, right? Unless it's a human, and you see how that's going through. So. In order to get those things, you have to have it. So if you can sit around and cheers with uh, champagne, if you can have a beer with your friends, if you can have a cocktail at night or have a cocktail at a club, but then you vilify smoking weed because you want to associate it with smoking cigarettes, you're ignorant yes. to the science and you're ignorant to what the news is. You're a follower of old thought and that old thought was put there because people weren't going to make money off of it yeah so if they're not going to make money off it they're vilified let me tell you the reason for um prohibition the prohibition reason was that ford realized that in his cars you could use gas or you can use cornstarch liquor so if you can use alcohol to put in your car and not buy gas well rockefeller said i'm selling gas so he figured out a way to say that alcohol was illegal for consumption and know. for the use of cars. So you had to buy his gas. Not that it was bad for you. I didn't, if I Jesus didn't. turned, you know, like if Jesus turned water into wine, how could how could other Christians tell you you can't eat wine? That's ridiculous. <laughs> Drink wine. Like Jesus did it. Jesus was like, yo, man, I need some taste of this. You know, so. It, the stigma of telling them that cannabis is bad is legal in twelve in twenty five states. Uh, twelve, uh, twelve of them, twelve to fourteen of them are now uh, for recreational. And if if I were you, I would let my children know more about cannabis than I would about cognac, more about cannabis than I would about vodka and gin, because they're going to drink vodka and gin. Yeah, they're going to go to a party. They're going to get shit faced. They're going to go to uh, spring break and you're going to see girls going wild and you're going to be like, is that my daughter? Are those her titties? Right. You know what doesn't happen? They smoke weed. No one yeah. feels like dancing around pulling their titties out. Very true. <laughs> I've, so definitely, I've definitely That's never right. seen some weed titties. No, you ain't seen no weed titties. And, and you, you're not going to and you're going to have literally there's no DU highs. There's DU eyes. No DU highs. Because if you high, you're like, I don't feel like driving. <laughs> no one got high and said, I feel like driving fast. No one. No one. So this is definitely a thing because it's also healing your body. It's relaxing your mind. It's relaxing your blood vessels so blood can flow better. It's enhancing and, and, and making blood come to areas. You're literally enhancing yourself when you ingest cannabis. One thing, and this is a business podcast, but we always end up talking about other shit. But I'm glad that, that you talked about what you're doing in the 25 states and the 12 with the recreational. So this is a thing. It's like our, my grandkids, your great grandkids, like they're gonna look at this time like, yo, why didn't you get involved with the rise of cannabis and the business aspect? For, for anybody right now, what should we be focused on, on trying to invest in cannabis? How do we do it? You have your own company. Like, can you give people advice, please, on how we can get yes. our money involved? So uh, I work with a company out of Nevada um, called Flower One. They're out of Canada. You can invest in Flower One right now on the Canadian stock market. It's F-O-N-E. That's what the, the codes are. Um, the one I'm here in America, we're going to be probably one of the first CBD companies 
um, to go public. It's called Bud Trader. You can look them up. We should be going public, I think, in July or August. And that's going to change everything. We're the only thing moving right now. Uh, they're able to uh, sell things from, like, you can order my weed from Northern California. I'm in Los Angeles, but we grow it in Northern California. If you want the weed, you could have it because of Bud Trader in San Diego, which is eight hours away in less than four hours, if they were going to have it delivered, if it wasn't in Los Angeles. So Bud Trader is literally pushing, and we got like six Bud Trader stores, um, I'm a major investor in Bud Trader. I have a lot of shares in Bud Trader. I put a lot into this company because I wanted, you can't be first, second. So I, I said, this is going to be the first to get it. Like I said, we get the arrows, but we also get the, we get the merit. So we're pushing this idea that Bud Trader is the next way to go. So if you're going to invest, look into when Bud Trader goes public. I'm telling you in advance. I don't even think it's illegal for me to say that yeah. uh, because I'm giving you, I'm not giving you uh, investing. I'm just telling you where I'm invested. I'm invested in Bud Trader. I'm invested in the Flower One. I used to be, no longer, but I used to be um, a holder of Canopy. Now, Canopy became one of the largest companies in, in Canada. Uh, just to give you an example, when I got involved, Snoop, you know, Snoop got me was there and Snoop said, so you down? I was like, yes. So Snoop was able to get more shares than me. He got a lot of shares. I got a quarter of what he got. So think about that. He got one. I got a quarter yeah. of what he got. You figure out how many shares he got when I said one and I got a quarter, 250,000. So they were at $2 when we got in, right? $2. Canopy was at $54 not a year later. So imagine if he would have kept his one and waited two years, he had $54 million. Jesus. Yeah. So if you want to invest, invest in the futures of cannabis, they're not going to lose, especially by the time they get to the stock exchange. They know, go to Canada. They know exactly what's happening. When I went to Canada uh, 2014, I saw them trading cannabis futures at $800 million. They were trading per day in the future of cannabis. And here in America, the same thing happened when I, I got Lasix done to my eyes. Um, I could have got it done in 1992, but it wasn't approved in America yet. Two years later, it was approved in America and everybody went and got Lasix. It was always easier to go over to Canada and get things done that were approved ahead of time. So I'm telling you to look into it. Flower One is where I'll our money is now because we saw the facility that they have and how they're building in North in uh, Nevada, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, 400,000 square feet of a hydro, uh, hydroponic grow of some of the cleanest, tastiest cannabis I have ever seen. Cleanest place. I, I mean, cleaner than, than, than uh, surgeon rooms, than, yeah. than operating rooms. I'm telling you. So I saw that they were, and everything I do, I invest into my lifestyle. So my lifestyle of veganism, organic thinking, uh, eco-friendly, making my footprint on the planet as small as possible. One of the things with Deuces 22, our packaging, even though it's a plastic, it decomposes in three years. Now we're waiting on this one package that decomposes in one year. So literally after you finish smoking, if you're not going to reuse it, you can pack it with dirt, put it in the ground, and in a year or two years, it's just going to be dirt. So I literally do this in every part of my life, trying to be the best human I can possibly be while I'm on the planet. That's amazing, man. The uh, consistency, because most people aren't consistent with their behaviors and their yeah. money and their actions. So that says a lot about your character. With yeah, Dio Hughley said, oh, so you vegan? Yeah. What about your sneakers? I said, yeah, I still got my Air Force <laughs> One. They're in the closet. I'm not buying any new ones. I said, but I got involved with a company called Q4. And one of the things I said with Q4 is I need to make a vegan shoe. You know what was crazy? Last week, Adidas released their vegan shoe. Literally saying vegan shoe. Released it knowing this is, this is not leather. It's man synthetic leather. But why should an animal have to give up his skin so you can say, look down at my feet? And not only that, I traded in my Mercedes because I'm black and a professional basketball player, and that comes with the rule. <laughs> yeah, I traded in my Mercedes, and I got a Tesla. The reason I got a Tesla, I don't want to be involved in, fuel, in fossil fuels. 
I charge my car right here at the house and the entire car is vegan. So I live, I live what I, what I say and I don't preach. I just live what I preach. I live like a sage. I do it according to how I want my life to be. Have you been to, um, I can't think of the damn cannabis cafe in LA. Yeah. Have you been there? Yeah. I went, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah I went there. That yeah. shit, that's just amazing. Ain't it? It's, it's, it's really, really dope. Um, I wish it was a vegan cafe. I wish they they serve they serve some some of the foods. Uh, I really don't dine in places. I can't say that. I usually dine in places that are completely vegan. Yeah. But one place in California that I dined that's not completely vegan, and it was rated the best steakhouse in all of Los Angeles, and that's Craig's. And the reason I still go to Craig's is half the menu is vegan and the other half has flesh. Oh, of damn. course, Craig, the owner, had become a vegan. He sells in stores uh, Craig's vegan ice cream. People, this is the movement. This is the way it's going. And and you know, soon as China took on, give us Beyond Meat, give us these things. Soon as the largest um, landmass of people change the way they are, it's over. Like in India, there's 1.3 million people, and only the Muslims eat meat. The Hindu, they don't eat meat. They might know that. No, they don't. So that's the largest vegan country there is. And they said, well, how could you get all your energy? How could you get your protein? There's 1.2.5 billion Indians, and half of them don't eat meat. They're having a lot of babies. So pay attention to people around you where they tell you what you need to eat, how you need to focus. Check those people first. Check out those people, the ones telling you, are the ones that are studied. No, they're not. So I went on Dr. Oz in 2008 with my teammate Rick. And before I got on, I said, Oz, can I talk about coconut oil and the ingested coconut oil? It cooks at a higher temperature. It's better for. He was like, no, no, the guys say too much saturated fat. I said, well, that's a different saturated fat than the saturated fat from an animal. He goes, oh, my, my doctors and the guys that put things together don't want to go with it. Four years later, he's talking about coconut oil. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hit him up? No, I didn't have to. He knows where it came from. Like I said, I don't have that ego. The deal is, and now I tell, I don't put really any oil in my body except maybe a little bit of grapeseed oil. I try to keep as much oil. Your body is 80% water. There's no reason for oil inside your body, period, whatsoever. Don't tell me fish oils. Don't tell me um, eat this. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Because your body is 80% water. So what do we know? Oil and water don't what? Mix. Mix. Yeah. So if you all of a sudden cook in olive oil, no. Because as soon as it touches heat, that turns into instant fat. That's what he was talking about. The bad fat is in the olive oil that you cook. You want olive oil? Eat the olive. Do you? I don't know if you've, if you've done this yet or if it's on your website or something. Can you like put everything that you put into your body, like your meals, your diet plan? Because I know a lot of people are going to ask after this. And I think it would be really educational for somebody who we know comes from our community, understands all this, and they can just completely mimic it. Because we're giving all this information, but it's very difficult for people to go do stuff on their own. And once you start shopping vegan, you hear this, you hear that. Like I think it would, it would, it would be great if you could just put everything together. If you need us yeah, to help, I got there. you. Well, the first thing you go on my website, johnsally.com, S-A-L-L-E-Y, and you'll see a vegetarian starter kit. Now, the vegetarian starter kit was put together by Dr. Neil Bernard, um, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, PCRM, and his crew. He wrote a bunch of books, Dr. T. Colin Campbell, um, Dr. Eckerson. Uh, you'll see them all in What the Health. And you can see how to start it. So when somebody tells me it's expensive, I go, hmm, $365,000 for a heart operation, $365,000 for a heart operation, right? If you have a heart attack, it's $65,000 off the top, period. You have diabetes, you're going to have to give yourself a shot. That money is going to kick in. You don't even want to add up what the insulin is. We just bought the insulin price down. But when you go to farmer's markets and the majority of the food you, that I'm going to tell you to eat is what's grown. And when you look and see there's over 3000 vegetables, 3000 recipes to making vegetables. There's only maybe 100 to how you can cook meat. So 
you're going, it's very inexpensive. Even so far as inexpensive, one, it brings you closer to your family. Two, it teaches you to be at home. So you're eating in a more calm situation. Uh, two, and if you go to a vegan restaurant, it's not expensive. What expensive is having a heart attack? Yeah. What is expensive is buying clothes every year because you gain weight. Mm -hmm. What is expensive is um, literally uh, somebody else's, some other, human, some other mammal's life is more expensive than vegan food. So eat your vegetables, eat your fruit, eat your legumes, and eat your nuts and seeds. And when I say that to you, every day I'll have sunflower seeds very and, and pumpkin seeds, great for your prostate, man. Handful, right? Because my fist is as big as my stomach. So a handful is as many seeds. I chew them as, as well as I can, swallow them down. I eat um, uh, pistachios, uh, uh, almonds. Um, I soak my almonds. Um, uh, cashews. So make sure you soak your nuts, meaning let them sit in there and grab water and then let them dry. And they go, well, I have a nut allergy. Well, if you have a nut allergy, then eat more vegetables, eat more fruit, detox your body, eat herbs that kill parasites. And all those parasites eventually that are out of your stomach and out of your way, you're rebuilding the flora and your immune system. I bet if you try a nut then, I'm not saying it, so I'm not going to say it, but do those things and let's see what happens. Yep. Cool, man. Well, this was dope, man. You, man, you gave a lot of gems, a lot of gems. I know that we could have kept going definitely on like the yeah. basketball stuff. Next bro. time, next time. <laughs> Absolutely. So if there's anything that you want people to focus on, I, I know you mentioned a lot of your companies, but where can they find you? Where can they reach you? Where can everybody um, find John Sally? You can find John Sally on johnsally.com. You can check me out on Vlad. I have like a series with Vlad. You can, because he'll ask some really deep questions. I'll go to it. Um, I'm starting what you said, like a show that literally explains. I realize that most of the adults don't know things. Yeah. Because uh, this thing called television, right? It tell a vision of someone else. So a lot of that television was thrown in. And then every time you watch something that's healthy, when the commercials come on, the sound goes up and they convince you that this stuff is good. When you see cheese melting and you see burger dropping off and, and you see chicken and what you call it, you see people laughing. It's so funny. I say this to people. If they were to show a picture of literally how that stuff was made, they wouldn't eat it. Yep. But if you show a picture or video of your food being picked, it's different. Yep. Yep. I definitely agree. And I think a lot of people too, men don't realize with them commercials, like a lot of that shit's candle wax and all types of shit where they got the cheese dripping. Like it's not even, it's not even cheese, nigga. It's no. fucking pig snot or some other shit. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. And I tell people, if you want a hot dog and you want a hamburger, trust me, they're not giving you supposedly the good part of the animal. They're giving you the leftover ground down and then put into a form. That shit's gross, <laughs> man. <laughs> I just I thought you thought you know you might enjoy that you know see what it is. I always tell people they go away. I'm gonna go on a dinner date. I tell girls, I say, "Do you go to dinner? Yeah, I'm going to dinner." I go, "Oh, y'all not having sex after?" Because I don't know. <laughs> I maybe. And they go, "Why would you say that?" I go, "Well, if he eats a steak, he ain't having sex after. He going to sleep." Exactly. Exactly. I just oh. gonna kick in. <laughs> One more question, because my homeboys man, they man, they want me man to ask you this. Everybody went to go see Bad Boys 3, dog. Like, what the fuck? Like, what? You know what well, I mean? Was, I'm on a series with Gabrielle Union and Jessica Alba. They just pushed back the release of it called LA's Finest. And I play Fletcher on a TV series Thank you. the past two years. So, uh, Diesel. So, I that's how I play that. So, I wasn't allowed to get involved on Diesel. I wasn't allowed to get involved in it the other way. Uh, because LA, he needed that. Come here a second. He needed uh, adjust this light over here, please. Um, they needed to come up with a whole new line of things. And okay. How. Yeah. Okay. Because that, cause that floor seat shit, that's that's yeah. classic. That's classic shit. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, man, we made it up as we were going. I was about to ask, was that ad lib? Like, did Martin ad lib that, or was that in the uh, script? Yeah. We, we, he, that's Martin. God bless Martin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but cool. Well, I appreciate you coming on, man. I appreciate everybody man, that listened and shared anything that you ever need need help with. Um, if you ever need me to push something, promote something, 
you doing this for me and for my business, man, has just been been monumental. So literally, if you ever need me for anything, man, let me know because I'll be down. Well, down that, that's that's why when I saw when I saw your Instagram and you said come on the podcast, it was no problem. It was no problem whatsoever. Thank you, babe. So cool. Appreciate that. This is damn. Did, are y'all all right? <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know, we, we get in the studio, right? I, I'm using you because I got to do so much tomorrow. Yeah, that I'm using you to get my studio correct. <laughs> All right, cool, man. So right. This was this was John Sally. We out the pond. Y'all stay true. All right. Peace. Peace.